Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship this week. We all have lists. We all have lots to do, things to accomplish. There's always something that we could say we need to do rather than stopping, carving out time for God, carving out time daily for devotion to God, prayer, reading of scripture, meditation, service to God's people, our brothers and sisters. There's always something we could do not to stop each week to worship together. In this time when some still feel uncomfortable coming into large groups, um, we continue to provide these YouTube worship services, but we also thank you for carving out time to worship with us. May God bless us as we worship together. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your Son, Jesus, the Christ, our Lord, our King. We pray today that you would grant all of us, the people of earth, now divided and enslaved by sin, to be free and brought together under, under Christ's gentle and loving rule. Christ, our King. And now as we read scripture in which he is identified as king, as we consider our call in response to this, as we open ourselves to the movement of your spirit to transform our lives for your kingdom, bless us by the power of the Holy Spirit of our king, your son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this week comes from the 18th chapter of John. Um, just a reminder, we are in the midst of a worship series that is looking at the I am sayings of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life, I am the good shepherd, and so on. Um, we're being guided in this by um, a theologian and pastor from England, Leslie Weatherhead. I'm using his book over his own signature to guide me. And this week we come to the idea of Jesus as king. And as we shall see when we uh, read this passage, this one is a little different from some of the other I am sayings. Let us listen now to the word of God from the 18th chapter of John's gospel, verses 33 through 37. Let us see what the spirit would say to the church. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, <clears throat> summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, replied I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who listens, everyone who belongs to the truth, listens to my voice. This is the reading of the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if we were to line the I am sayings of Jesus up, writing them out on a, or typing them on a piece of paper, not the whole passage that we find them in, but just the, the sentences, the statements by Jesus, I am the bread of life, I am uh, the, the living water, I am these things. If we were to do that, we might see that one of these things is not like the other, and the one that might not be like the other is perhaps this one. 
Because you see here, Jesus does not say, I am the king. It is not as direct and forthright a statement as we find in other places. Rather, Jesus is being asked by Pilate. Remember, this is after he's been arrested. He's been tried by the Jewish authorities. He's been handed over to the Roman authority, Pilate. And Pilate asks him, are you a king? And Jesus says, well, you say I'm a king. Or we might hear Jesus saying, well, it's complicated. You see, Jesus is wise enough to know that if he says yes to this statement, yes, I am the king, then he's admitting to charges that aren't exactly right. But if he says no, he's dismissing a deeper truth. He's denying a deeper truth about himself and his purpose. Something deeper about his kingship. And so he says, in essence, well, it's complicated. Jesus, in other words, says, no, I'm not a king like you mean, Pilate. He's not a king in the sense that Pilate is asking. We know this to be true because even earlier in John's gospel in the sixth chapter, um, after he's performed some signs, people want to come. We're told people want to come and make him king. But he hides. He goes up the mountain by himself. He will not let them do this. And this trip into Jerusalem where he's come to the Passover, uh, this hasn't a a really turned into the revolutionary overthrow that some of his followers thought, it, even some of his closest disciples perhaps thought it might be. It's been far from that. So no, Jesus is not a king in the sense that Pilate is asking, but in some sense, in some deeper sense, Jesus is certainly king. Even in his answer, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom. He's acknowledging he has a kingdom. Elsewhere, he talks about sitting at table in his kingdom. And when he entered Jerusalem in, that, what we, in the triumphal entry that we celebrate on Palm Sunday, he seems to support those people who cry out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And do we not call him Christ, Messiah? Hebrew and Greek words that can easily be translated king. The early church certainly believed Jesus was king. Leslie Weatherhead points out that both Paul and John call him king of kings and lord of lords and that the New Testament speaks consistently about Christ's reign. Even uh, the word throne occurs 30 times or more in just, just the book of Revelation. And the Pauline epistles place him far and above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, both in this world and also in that which is to come. And later Paul says he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. So no, perhaps Jesus is not the king in the sense that Pilate asked the question, but yes, yes. Jesus is king. And maybe Jesus doesn't say it quite as explicitly here as he says, as he makes statements about himself in other places, but we understand it to be true. Jesus is king. Now, I want to follow Weatherhead's commentary on this passage a little more closely than I have in weeks uh, prior to this, because I think he makes three really important points. You see, Weatherhead suggests that there are three different responses that we as God's people might have to the claim that Christ is king. Three different responses, the sneer, the vision, and the challenge. So let's look at those three responses. The first one's a little uncomfortable. The sneer, what do we mean by that? Well, some people might hear the claim that Jesus is king Christ is king of this world. Some people might say that in their response, and sometimes our response, even if we don't say it out loud, might be, what? What do you mean king? In what sense is Jesus king of this world today? Look around us. Look at the poverty around us. Look at the violence in homes and communities among people who disagree politically and ideologically. Look at the violence between and among nations. Look at all of the brokenness in our world, the disease, the people lying at young ages in hospital rooms suffering, and people across the spectrum of demographics and age suffering from 
a years long pandemic. Look at the world around us. Look at the brokenness. Look at the natural disasters. In what way exactly is Jesus king? As I considered this response, Weatherhead says we might have to this idea of Jesus as king, um, several experiences that I've had in ministry came immediately to mind. I remember standing in a hospital room in the VA hospital in Decatur, Georgia, in the room of a young man in his early 20s who had no health care except what the VA might offer him, who was dying of cancer, leaving behind a wife and two young children. And in our conversation, he didn't say the explicit words, but what he was asking was, in essence, where is King Jesus for me, for my family? Or visiting with a prisoner in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, looking through his, speaking to him through a little slot in his solid metal door in a small uh, cell that had only a bed, a toilet, and a sink, with a few personal belongings, a place he would spend the rest of his life because he was in solitary confinement for the rest of his life, only able to go outside an hour a day, sometimes, into a pen, very little human contact. He wondered, in essence, where Jesus was as king for him or volunteering at the Urban Ministry Center where day after day, any day you went, you saw scores, dozens of people living in abject poverty, standing in line for hours just to do the load of clothes that they could carry on their back, standing in line for hours just to get a shower, maybe once or twice a week, standing in line for hours or for a long time to get one bowl of soup that might be their only meal that day unless they could find another handout. No place to... Uh, no address to give an, a, a, a potential employer, no place to receive mail except the Urban Ministry Center. Living in that kind of poverty day after day after day, season after season after season, how many of them ask, where is this King Jesus in my life? Unless we think it's just those who are dying of cancer, just those who are in prison, just those who are living in poverty, there are others of us who ask that question regularly as well. I call to mind one eight day period in my ministry when eight days apart, I got calls from two separate families. Families, both of whom had plenty of wealth, plenty of stuff, all the stuff they could, could want in life. They had so much going for them. And yet on Christmas Eve, I received a call from a woman who was huddled with her two young daughters in one of the daughter's bedrooms with a cell phone that was dying because their, her alcoholic husband had cut the power to the house, cut the telephone lines, taken all the car keys, and was in essence holding them hostage. Eight days later, seven days later on New Year's Eve, receiving a phone call from a different family, also very wealthy, lots going for them, at least as far as the world could see. And this wife was calling, sobbing, because her husband was being led away in handcuffs because he had pushed her down the stairs and threatened physical violence to their children. Where was Jesus in those moments for them, they might ask? Now, Weatherhead, to his credit, does not deny this hurt and pain in the world. He does not deny this brokenness. He does not try to dismiss it or explain it away. He simply says, this is real. This is true. He acknowledges it honestly and then goes on, not, not to say, but Jesus is king. Rather, he says, this is true and at the same time, there is another response we might have to the claim of Jesus as king, and that is the vision. The vision that is contrary to the evidence around us. Now, Leslie Weatherhead is British, as I have told you before, and so he speaks from his own context, and he gives an example to explain this from his, his own experience. And in England, of course, Great Britain, they have a monarch. They have a monarch. And it 
was in his life and actually still is Queen Elizabeth. And so he gives her the exa as an example Queen Elizabeth. He says, uh, for example, at her coronation, she presented a powerful vision for Great Britain being one people working together. And he shares some of the things, some of the parts of this vision that she presented. And then he says, now listen, not everybody in England lives up to this. Not all aspects of our life in Great Britain live up to this. But just because not all of England lives up to the vision doesn't mean the vision isn't still there. It doesn't mean that Elizabeth is not still queen and not still working to bring this vision about. So it is, he says, with Christ's reign. Yes, Christ is king. Christ has come and Christ reigns. And the kingdom has not come in all its fullness yet. We live with a vision of the kingdom that stands in opposition to some of the realities around us in this world. I've heard other theologians and pastors uh, use the end of a world war to explain this phenomenon of the faith. For example, we all know that the war ended on D-Day. Everybody in the world knew that after D-Day, the world war was practically over. There was no hope for it to go on. But it didn't end until the E-Day. It ended on D-Day for all practical purposes, but the war did not officially end until VE Day. And so there was still fighting to be done. There were still lives lost. There was still misery to be lived through. And so it is with Christ's kingdom. Christ has come. The kingdom is here at hand, yet the kingdom has not come in its fullness. And we live between these realities but we live with the vision of the kingdom. We live with the vision of the kingdom in opposition to, contrary to all other evidence. So those are two responses we might have to the, to the claim of Jesus as king, the sneer and the vision. And the third, the third option we have to respond is what Weatherhead calls the challenge. I prefer to call it the call. It's a better theological word. We often talk about vocation, our calling from God as people of faith. And our call is that we, we got to go to work. We have a job to do. Our job is to work for the fullness of the kingdom. Henry Emerson Fosdick, the great uh, popular early 20th century pastor, put it this way. We have not failed to set Christ in the light of beauty, to hold Christ up in glory and beauty. We've not failed to set Christ in the light of beauty, but we have failed to set Christ in the light of duty, of working, of obedience, of service. You see, Fosdick says, Jesus did not say, worship me. Jesus said, follow me. We have a call. We have a job to do. Remember last week we talked about God's word to Moses. God said, hey, Moses, I've heard my people crying out in Egypt, so I'm going to save them. So Moses, you go get to work and save them. We have a similar situation here. Christ has come. The kingdom is at hand. Christ reigns. So let us get to work proclaiming and bringing about Christ's kingdom. Henry Blackaby is a Canadian Baptist minister who had a, a, a discipleship Bible study that was popular some 20, 25 years ago. And it was called Experiencing God. And one of his fundamental assertions in that study was this, God is already at work. We don't have to, you know, ask God to get to work in the world. God's already working all around us. God is at work. And God is always inviting us into that work. God is always inviting us to participate in God's work for the kingdom. So that's our call. In response to the vision of Christ as king, that stands 
in opposition to, contrary to some other evidence in our world, in response to that other evidence of brokenness and pain and hurt in our world, sin and death and loss and loneliness, in response to all that, we are called to be at work, to join in the work that God is doing for the kingdom. And so the question for us is that we live with this day and every day of our lives. How will we participate in kingdom work? How will we participate in the bringing about of Christ's lordship and kingdom? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As we turn to God in prayer, um, in Mecklenburg and Union County, I think uh, both is the case that both of those schools are beginning uh, tomorrow, uh, Monday the 29th. Uh, other schools have already started. Some will start a little later, uh, but it's that time of year. And uh, we have some teachers in our congregation. We have some students in our congregation. And many of us have teachers or, and or students in our families and communities that we know about whose lives are, um, who, who are starting this part of their life this year. And, um, and if you could be in our sanctuary, you would see that we have a, an entire pew absolutely packed with school supplies that we've collected for Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. We have a, um, a new resident or, or, or a renter in our, in our church building this year. Um, it's a, a tutoring organization that's uh, tutoring children uh, who in, in school and in subjects. And so we have a lot going on that has to do with the beginning of the school year. And so our prayer today is from Terry Ott, who is the uh, editor of the Presbyterian Outlook. And it's a prayer for students and parents and teachers um, in this week and day, in, in these days of transition. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Holy God, the excitement builds. Perhaps there's a little girl grinning to show off a missing tooth to friends she hasn't seen all summer. Or a little boy too antsy to stand still on the stoop in front of his house. Maybe there's a little girl proud to show off her, her new shoes this first day of school, or a little boy too cool to hold mom's hand as they walk across the parking lot. God bless these children and the parents who make them pose for pictures before the first day of school. Bless all our children. Perhaps it's the first day of high school or the first day of a senior year. Children getting on school buses, backpacks heavy with hope, anxious for acceptance, needy for nurturing. Bless our children who aren't as innocent as we'd like. Our children for whom active shooter drills are routine and thoughts and prayers are not enough, but must be joined with action. God, bless our parents who have laughed and played and traveled and mediated and intervened and fed and nurtured all summer long. Parents who are ready, but maybe not so ready for summer days to end and school to resume. Bless our parents who pack backpacks and make lunches and create schedules and to-do lists. For toddlers and teenagers, difficult to get out the morning door. Bless our parents who perhaps struggle to find the time and the resources to do these things because of working several jobs. Bless them with patience. Bless them with peace. Grace for themselves and their children. Bless them with long memories of these days that pass too quickly when not noticed. 
God bless our teachers, school administrators, and support staff. Those to whom we entrust our children all year long. Bless them with appreciation for their invaluable work. Bless them with needed supplies they don't have to pay for. They don't have that they must pay for out of pocket. Bless them with New Year excitement. Bless their toothy grins and students who love to learn. Bless them with the kind of joy that comes when you know you are meeting society's needs through your chosen profession. And God bless these offerings we have collected here in our sanctuary. Supplies that some children may not have were we not to collect them. Supplies that will make teachers' lives a little easier. Some supplies for teachers themselves. Bless offerings. And may these offerings bear fruit. Gather us, O oh God, we pray, around our children, our parents, teachers, and school staff as this new school year begins. Anoint us with your grace. Fill us with your love. Inspire us for your service. Bless us as a community, guided by your spirit, called to care for and nurture the young for the sake of their future, and ours. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave our time of worship, let us go forth acknowledging what is contrary to God's kingdom around us and raising up, lifting up the vision of the kingdom in all its fullness and having our eyes opened by the power of the Holy Spirit to what God is doing and how we might join kingdom work in our midst. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.